landmark work. It's called Comanche Empire. Now I know I'm going to butcher this poor guy's name. Pika Hamal Lanin. P-E-K-K-A-H-A-M-A-L-A-I-N-E-N. Uh, it's winner of the 2009 Bancroft Prize, winner of the 2008 Kate Brooks Bates Award, co-winner of the 2009 Merrill Curdy Award, winner of the 2008 Great Plains Distinguished Book Prize. It is Yale University. Acknowledgements reversed. Several uh, acknowledgements in here. It says this book is about an American empire that according to conventional history did not exist. It tells a familiar tale of expansion, resistance, conquest, and loss, but with reversal of usual historical roles. It is a story in which Indians expand, dictate, and prosper, and European colonists resist, retreat, and struggle to survive. Well, it really is a fascinating story. Pika is an associate professor of history, University of California at Santa Barbara. It's published in association with the William P. Clements Center for Southwest Studies, Southern Methodist University. This is the Lamar series in Western history. It does uh, put a whole new light and you get a lot more education and, and find out some, some extenu uh, extenuating truths that well, we're never told. Even in modern days, up until the last few years, they weren't telling the real story about these people. The interesting thing about the Comanches is that they were an offshoot of the Shoshones. And they came uh, and broke off and went down into the west of New Mexico, but around Texas in that area, and became uh, one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful, uh, uh, tribes in the United States. Now their biggest claim to fame uh, was the horse. Now they actually got the horse from the Utes and the Spanish had let horses get got loose and stuff. These guys started stealing them. <laughs> their, their, their big claim to fame was they stole almost everything that they got for for their people. But they became a uh, a mobile uh, tribe. In other words, they kept moving. They didn't. They weren't sedentary. They didn't have permanent camps where they did farming or anything. There were some, some of their mortal enemies, or who they're sworn, or they always fought with, were the Apaches. Now there are many other uh, tribes of Apaches, but these guys went after the Apaches because the Apaches were trying farming, and so they could descend upon their plots and wipe them out and take them. Now almost all tribes took captives and slaves of each other. What I did not know and it was in here is that much later in this book was about when they moved the like Trail of Tears and they moved all the uh, Ch Cherokees and Choctaws and Creeks and all of those into the uh, expansion of o into Oklahoma and all of that that they take with them 5,000 uh, um, Afro-American or black slaves with them. So everybody was enslaving. I guess what peeved the, the American government now, they really got on, the, they really started with the Spain. The Spain had a hard time with these folks and these people had a, a an idea about when they did trading that it wasn't to become subservient under them. And the Spanish always try, well, if you take my gifts, here's what you have to do. And if you come over here, you have to become a Catholic and take the baptism. And they said, no, we ain't doing that. Most of them said no. So that was a big conflict for many years. And then when they started losing, the Spanish started losing control. 1821, and Mexico finally won its independence. And then they started having some trouble with the Cherokee and all that, but the 
I mean the Comanche, excuse me. But when they finally came in and and the Americans uh, and after 18 and 30, you know the Americans that came out with this act called the American Indian Removal Act of 1830. It's like the Chinese Exclusion Act. So, America, shame on you. And I don't know, now you know why I'm pissed off it has to be over at the, at the uh, adult side for this because well, there's atrocities everywhere, but these people were imperialistic and they had their own uh, consensus. When the tribes got together, they all listened. They had hierarchies. They had trade routes. They, they had their own, own way of doing things and looking at it. And it's just the way it was. And, but a lot of people were thought that they were inferior, barbarous, because they didn't uh, uh, click onto our religions and all of that. But they were a powerful people. But the horse really was the secret. They could move faster, and they could subjugate other nations, and they traded a lot of their meat and skins. And eventually all that became their downfall by the attrition of the American forces after the Civil War in the 1870s, the early reservations started, that they, the white bison hunters went out and just started killing them. Now, a lot of it was uh, excuses to, well, they were, the Industrial Revolution was happening. They said that the belts, the overhead belts that ran a lot of the, uh, the equipment, was best made from buffalo leather. And so they also figured out, hey, here's how we can take these people's livelihood because the uh, Comanche uh, solely lived on um, bison. Now they figured out they had to have protein and stuff, so they did do trading with other tribes and they went into New Mexico at Taos and Santa Fe and they had fairs like the old rendezvous with the French, and they uh, got maize and beans and other carbohydrates. So that's how they uh, did have a buck. But what they really wanted was guns and, and gunpowder and metal. So they jumped straight into the metal age, and that's really what accelerated their, their growth. They actually exploded in their population from a, you know, a few hundred or not many more until they had 40, 50,000. Of course, the white man and their uh, smallpox got them. But they tried to stay away for a long time, and since they moved and didn't get around a lot of white people at first, or Caucasians, they didn't get the, the uh, smallpox like they did back in, in the East. So it's a fascinating story. It's a true story. It's, it's the story told more from their perspective, and they didn't sugarcoat this, folks. This, this is some tough reading, <laughs> but you'll learn these people didn't take no crap from anybody, you know. They were a proud people, and they fought amongst themselves, just like we always still fight today amongst ourselves. They did form loose uh, treaties, and then they were forced by the Spanish, Anza, they call him De Anza, who's in 1780. Uh, did a lot of work with getting them. And, but so they had compacts with even the Navajos. Now, they were a long ways away, but they did interchange a little bit. And they all were against the Apache, of course. Every one of them, that's all they did. Let's go after the Apache. They'd always take captives, men, women, and uh, children. And one of the greatest uh, Comanches was a half-breed called Quinaw Parker. His mother was a white woman. But he came in the 1870s as, as a, one of the last chiefs that held out against the white man. And then, of course, when they finished up with these folks and they went after the Lakota, the Sea Ox, that... Uh, uh, culminated with Wounded Knee in 1890. I, I was shocked. And, and before that was the Custer. 
and all the little big horn and all that, but that has nothing to do with the, the Comanches. But it does have the uh, attrition wars of the of the American government. So the, these tri people tried to put the French and the and the uh, Spanish at arms with each other, at pit each other, and certain other tribes, and and they had their own. Uh, we call Osage and, and Pawnees were powerful. So they kind of stayed out of each other's ways. Sometimes they uh, built packs with them. Sometimes they lasted a few years. And sometimes uh, uh, it just got out of hand and and all of that. It was really a push to take people away from their native ways of life and uh, put them all on reservations and and then gobble up the land. And that's what happened in America. So the truth is the truth, folks. But read the book like I did. It's a great seminal work. It is a landmark work. It's exhilarating. A nascent account of the complex social, cultural, and biological interactions that the acquisition of the horse unleashed in North America. And a brilliant analysis of a Comanche social formation that dominated the southern plains. It's an impressive achievement. Thus, a major native power emerged and dominated the interior of the continent, compels a rethinking of well-worn narratives about colonial America and Western expansion, about the relative power of European and native societies, and about the directions of change. This book makes a major contribution to Native American history and challenges our understanding of the ways in which American history unfolded. That was from Colin G. Calloway, author of One Vast Winter Count, The Native American West, before Lewis and Clark. So it really started out, uh, got heavy after uh, Jefferson and the uh, purchase from uh, the Louisiana. See, Louisiana used to be French, and then the Spanish got it, and then they gave it back, or sold it back to France, and then France, in 1803, made the... Uh, Louisiana Purchase, and then from then on it was manifest destiny. It was the worst thing that ever happened to America. It's made and changed my mind about a few of our, our great presidents, but it is what it is, and this book is a, a seminal and a landmark work called Comanche Empire. Pika Amo sorry for that and I hope that you read the book and learn more about it yourself. Thank you for watching Terry ZTV and watch all of our book reviews, especially this one.